Genesis chapter 1, as we continue in our series, I Believe, I Believe. If I remember correctly, it was in the summer, immediately after I graduated from high school, that my pastor, Clarence Jones, began preaching a series of messages through Genesis 1 and 2. And I remember he was very detailed, and it was a very thorough exposition of the creation account in Genesis. In fact, he kind of was so detailed, people wondered, why on earth is he taking so much pain and effort to to preach these verses to the church? One of the things that he had mentioned in the preaching of those sermons was that he he warned of those who, who chose to believe in evolution and who teach it as fact in public and higher education. So he spent about a couple of months preaching on Genesis 1 and 2. And then I remember, because that was the summer after I graduated high school, I went off to college, and um, it just so happened to be that I took a class where the professor in the class questioned the authenticity of Genesis 1 and 2. He denied the literal existence of Adam and Eve, And then this professor exclaimed to our class that evolution is the only way this world came into existence. I remember returning home one weekend and I told my pastor about that. And he said, now you know why I took the time to preach those messages in Genesis. To prepare you and other students about the danger of those who will try to influence you and intimidate you into believing the theory of evolution over the biblical account of creation. I can also remember a little bit later in my college experience, I had another liberal professor who taught philosophy, and he made the statement in class that to believe the literal account of Genesis 1 and 2 is both bad science and bad Bible. Later on in my graduate school experience, I had a professor state that Genesis 1 through 11 is nothing more than myth and legend, not to be taken literally. Well, it was fascinating that every time I came up against those liberal professors in college, I would go back and reread those sermon notes that my pastor had preached years before. And it really did help me stand my ground as I stood on the inerrant, infallible Word of God. Now let me tell you, it has made the difference for me all of these years. As I mentioned, we are kind of in our back-to-school series here entitled, I Believe. And today I want to declare, I believe in the biblical account of creation. I believe in the biblical account of creation. In other words, I believe in creation over the theory of evolution. And this morning I just want to share a few reasons why. There are many, but just the time that we have to share a few reasons why I believe. Now, this morning I'm not sitting up here to tell you that all science agrees with Scripture. But I'm here telling you that all real science, all true science, all legitimate science must agree with Scripture. And let me tell you why. The same God that wrote the book, the book of Scripture, the Bible, also wrote the book of nature. And therefore, the book of nature can never contradict the Bible. Let me ask. Wouldn't you agree that the God who planted the the first tree ought to know his botany? Wouldn't you agree that the God who flung the first star into space ought to know his astronomy? Wouldn't you believe that the God who put the first granite rock in the ground ought to know his geology? Wouldn't you agree that the God who created the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and the beasts of the field ought to know his zoology? And wouldn't you agree that the God who breathed life into the first human being whose name happens to be Adam would know his biology? 
See, it would make no sense for God to say one thing in the book of Scripture and another thing in the book of nature. So in Genesis chapter 1, God clues us in on exactly how he created the world. Now, the reason scientists have a problem with the Bible and the creation account is because of the first four words of the Bible. Look there, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God. That's what they have a problem with. You see, many scientists have to try to prove how this world got here without, because they don't want to believe in God, and so they have to come up with a theory to prove how this world got here because they choose not to believe in God. And so that's where they really run into their problem is those first four words of the Bible, in the beginning, God. Because you see, before there was anything, there was the God who made everything. And the Bible says that behind the universe, there's, there's not a process per se, there's not just a power, but there is a person, and his name is God. Everything has to start with God. Now, secular scientists don't like that. They say that that is in the realm of faith, and faith has no place, has no role in science. But that's fascinating to me, because in every area of life, our lives are in the realm of faith. I mean, just get on Dixie Highway, the Watterson Expressway, or Spaghetti Junction, and you'll live by faith really quick, won't you? I mean, you go to the drugstore with a prescription from your doctor. Let me ask, have you ever been able to read that doctor's handwriting? Then how do you know the pharmacist can read that handwriting? And then the pharmacist hands you the medicine. How do you know he gave you the right medicine? How do you know the medicine will do what the doctor says? You, you take it all by faith, don't you? That's what you do. See, faith plays a part in every area of life. Now, the Bible tells us some very important things about God's role in the creation of this world. For example, the Bible tells us that God is creator. God is creator. Genesis 1-1 tells us, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God is creator. He created it all. The Bible also tells us that God is sustainer. That God is sustainer. Listen to Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 6. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that's on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. Colossians 1.17 says that he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. That means this whole world, this whole universe is held together by the Lord God himself. And so the Bible tells us that God is creator, that God is sustainer, and that God is owner. That God is owner. Psalm 24, 1 tells us, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. So the Bible tells us God is creator, God is sustainer, and God is owner. Now, if you don't get a hold of those three truths right there, then we may be tempted to believe what this culture is trying to sell us. Because the culture tries to sell us today that creation is God, and that the sustainer of creation is man. It's up to us. And then we're tempted to think that if those things are true, that the real owner of this, of this whole thing is absent. And that life is just sort of everybody just out for themselves. But that's not true. For the owner, our God, is very much here. And very much in control. For the Bible says creation declares God's glory. And the Bible says creation expresses God's wisdom. And the Bible says that creation reveals God's character. See, the Bible teaches us about creation's maker, our God, who is creator, sustainer, and owner. The Bible does not teach us, however, what a number of extreme environmentalists want us to believe. They want us to believe that nature is God. 
That nature is God and we should worship nature. Let me tell you something. Nature is not our mother and time is not our father. Amen? All right? The Bible does not teach that nature is God. The other thing the Bible does not teach, contrary to what extreme environmentalists are teaching today, is that all things are equally valuable to God. That means you are as valuable to God as a snail darter. Do you know that? That's what this culture is trying to sell you. That you are no more valuable than an animal or an insect at all. But I want you to hear something Jesus had to say. It's not in your notes, but you may want to jot this reference down. Matthew 12, verses 11 and 12. Because you need to understand that only mankind is made in the likeness of God. But listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 12. Jesus said to them, Which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? And then Jesus says, Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it's lawful to do good uh, on the Sabbath. So so what we're saying here is Jesus says, listen, uh, animals and people are not on the same level with God. People are much more valuable to God than animals. That's what took me aback when I read this quote by Peter Singer, who's one of the fathers of the modern environmental movement. He wrote, and I quote, It can no longer be maintained by no one but a religious fanatic that man is the special darling of the universe or that animals were created to provide us with food or that we have divine authority over them and divine permission to kill them. He went on to say this. In disgust, he said, six million Jews died in concentration camps, but six billion broiler chickens will die this year in slaughterhouses. Let that sink in. What's going on when you dare compare what happened in Nazi Germany to what happens in a chicken house? What's going on when extreme environmentalists believe that mankind and chickens are of equal value? One is not more important than the other. Now, I believe that Christians should be concerned conservationists, but not extreme environmentalists. Believers should do three things. We should care for creation. We should learn from creation. But ladies and gentlemen, we are to worship the one and only creator. The one and only creator, sustainer, and owner who is God, our Lord and Savior. Well, let me move on. Now the Bible obviously states that behind the creation of the universe, there is a maker, God himself. But the Bible also tells us that behind the creation of the universe, there was a method. There was a method. And what you're going to see is, whatever whatever else God is, whatever you think or know about God, our God is a God of order. That's why God said to the Corinthians, let everything be done decently and in order. Why? Because God loves order. God loves right things at the right time, in the right place, in the right way. And God did the very same thing when he created the world. So look again in Genesis 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Now here we're told that in the beginning, first of all, the earth was formless. It was without form. Secondly, it tells us the earth was void or empty. Now here's what I want you to notice. If you were to continue reading through chapter 1, God takes six days to deal with those two problems. The first three days of creation, God forms the earth. Why? He had to because it says here the earth was formless. So the first three days, he forms the earth. And then the next three days of creation, God fills the earth. He had to because the earth was void. It was empty. And so in a very orderly way, the first three days, he forms the earth. And the next three days, he fills the earth. Now, to show you how God is is such a God of order, 
I want to show you something you may never have noticed before in Genesis 1. When it comes to the six days of creation, there's a parallel between the days. There's a parallel between the first day and the fourth day, a parallel between the second day and the fifth day, and a parallel between the third day and the sixth day. For example, on the first day, God created light. But on the fourth day, He created the lights, like the sun, the moon, and the stars. On the second day, God created air and water. But on the fifth day, He created birds for the air and fish for the water. On the third day, God created plants and the land. On the sixth day, he created animals, and then he created man to live on the land and to eat and cultivate the plants. So, God lets us know right up front that you can expect order in the universe and in the creation. You, you can expect agreement in the universe because God made it that way, and that's the way God rolls because he is a God of order. And that's one of the problems with the theory of evolution. It's based on haphazard chance. It's based on chaos occurring over, over billions of years. It's based on haphazard biological, chemical, environmental coincidences taking place over billions of years where there's no order, there's no sequence, there's no agreement. So as I read Genesis 1 and 2, I see a maker and I see a method. Now, I don't know everything about how it all came about, but I am assured that God did create the world. Amen? Amen. And this is most important because I know some Christians as well as some non-Christians who say they believe God created the world, but that He used evolution to do it. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to make it clear. You cannot reconcile evolution with any interpretation of the Bible. You cannot reconcile evolution with any interpretation of the Bible. Now, let me just show you a little bit about where we're going this morning. There's a number of debates that are raging out there when it comes to creation versus evolution. And we really only have time for two or three that we're going to talk about today. But one of the debates that, that's raging out there in this conversation is the definition of the word day... D-A-Y, the definition of the word day in Genesis 1 and 2. People wonder, is it a literal 24-hour day? Did God really create the world in six literal days? Or does it represent periods of time, eras of time? That's one of the debates. The other debate is over whether we live on a planet that is a young earth or an old earth. Is this world 8,000 years old like the Bible would suggest? Or is it billions and billions of years old, like the evolutionists suggest? So, let's take a look at some of those real quickly. Did, did God create the world in six literal days or not? Well, we know God did what He did in a certain amount of time. Look at verse 5. God called the light day, and the darkness He called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Go down to verse 8. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. Now, the Hebrew word for day is yom, Y-O-M, yom. You've probably heard of the Jewish holiday, Yom Kippur, which stands for the Day of Atonement. Well, the Hebrew word yom is used over 1,400 times in the Old Testament, and it's translated in a number of different ways. Sometimes the word is translated as just one portion of the day. Sometimes it refers to an indefinite period of time longer than a day. And sometimes it refers to a period of several days. So what length of time is represented by the word day in Genesis chapter 1? Well, let me give you the interpretation held by the vast majority of evangelical scholars and scientists, and that is the six days of creation refer to six literal 24-hour days. And here's some of the reasons why we know that. For example, over 200 times in the Old Testament, the word yom, day, is used to refer to a 24-hour period of time. 
Actually, every time without exception, without exception, when the word yom is used with a specific number, it always refers to a 24-hour period of time. And so repeatedly in Genesis 1, God refers to a day as the evening and the morning. The evening and the morning. The evening and the morning. So now, why does God do it in that order? Why not morning and evening? Well, in the Gentile mindset, a day begins in the morning. But in the Jewish mindset, a day begins in the evening. And that's taken from Genesis 1 here, as well as the Sabbath law. But you see, many still question and say these six days refer to geological ages consisting of billions of years. Because you see, what they're trying to do is reconcile six days with an earth that evolutionists assume to be billions of years old. Listen, I personally do not believe that the earth is billions and billions of years old. You say, but, but if you go to the Grand Canyon and, and you see all the strata and all the layers and all the formations, well, let me ask you a second question regarding the other debate we mentioned earlier. Is it possible that God created the world instantaneously appearing older than it is? Is it? Is, is it possible that the earth looks older than it is? Is it possible that God created the world to look the way it did? Now, for example, look in Genesis 1. Go to verse 20. <clears throat> and God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creeping things, and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And it goes on like that. So here's, here's what I want to ask. When God created the first tree, how old did that first tree look? When God said, let there be a tree, it was a mature tree, right? How did the sun look when God spoke it into existence? Boom, there it is. How old does it look? Looks like it's been there longer than just a few seconds, doesn't it? How old did the first mountain look when God created it? How old did the first bird, the first fish, the first animal, the first man, the first woman, how did they look when they were created at the moment of creation? They were created in mature states. And then they were commanded to be fruitful and multiply. So we know the answer. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? The chicken came first. The chicken and the rooster so they could produce and, and multiply. And then there were the eggs and there were little chickens. So we know the answer to that age-old question. All you got to do is know your Bible. So could God have created a young earth with an old look? You bet. But here's the problem with those who refuse to believe in six 24 periods of time. 24-hour periods of time. Genesis 1, 11 through 14 tell us that, that plants were created on the third day. Now here's the problem. Plants were created on the third day, but the sun was not created until the fourth day. Now if you're looking at millions and billions of years, then you've got the problem of plants trying to grow before the sun was created. And we know scientifically that's an impossibility. Because plants live by a process known as photos. Yeah, listen, y'all are on top of it today. Y'all did stay awake in science class. Photosynthesis. Photo meaning light. Synthesis meaning with. Photosynthesis means with light. So without sunlight, plants cannot live, especially for millions or billions of years. Sunlight affects plants and vegetation dramatically. I mean, just try this science experiment at home in your leisure. 
place one plant in light for 30 days, plant another light in, uh, plant in darkness for 30 days, and see what happens to the two plants. God says, I made plants on the third day and the sun on the fourth day because my plants need the sun to grow and produce. But quickly, another reason I believe in six literal days of creation is because, this is going to sound kind of weird, but Moses believed it. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, it's not on your notes, but jot this reference down. Exodus 20, verse 11. Listen to what, what Moses said. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. Again, six literal days using the number six with the word yom, six days. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Moses believed it. You know, Moses believed in, that the world was created in six literal days. The New Testament tells us that Jesus believed what Moses said, and I believe what Jesus says. So I believe there's a good chain of, 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 of reaction there. Now, I don't really know what the big deal is or, or, or why people have a problem with God creating the world in six 24-hour periods of time because God could have created the world in 24 seconds. You know? But let me give you another reason I believe in the literal 24-hour days. And it's a rather crude reason, I must admit. But if God didn't mean 24-hour days in Genesis, then I have one simple question. Why didn't God say what He meant and mean what He said? God tells us exactly what He means and means exactly what He says. And that's why I believe. He says it's six days, and I believe there are six days. Again, he could have created it in 24 seconds, much less than six 24-hour literal days. But that's why I believe. Now, I want to hurry on because I want to touch on one other thing, and then we'll be done. There's a little phrase in the book of Genesis that to me is nothing short of a nuclear bomb on the theory of evolution, and I want to show it to you. Look in verse 11, chapter 1. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. I want you to notice the phrase, each according to its kind. Because we see that phrase again in verses 12, verse 21, verse 24, verse 25. No less than ten times do we see that phrase, each according to its kind, used in Genesis 1. Now, when God says something once, it's important uh, and good enough for me, but when God says something ten times, He's trying to get our attention. According to Genesis chapter 1, when God created a horse, it always stayed a horse. He didn't create an amoeba that turned into a tadpole, that turned into a fish, that turned into a bird, that turned into a horse. God didn't create an apple tree that eventually evolved into a pear tree. Everything was created, each according to its kind. Those words, each according to its kind, are the death knell of the theory of evolution. That means God has decreed that within species there may be mutation, but there will never be transmutation. And what I mean by that is this. Little horses may evolve into bigger horses over time, but little horses will never become um, frogs or birds or anything like that. Okay? Little apples may become bigger over time, but little apples never become watermelons. Amen? And little monkeys never evolve into human beings because everything happens each according to its kind every single time. I remember as a high school student hearing about the so-called missing link, that if only the evolutionists could find the missing link in the evolutionary chain, that process between apes becoming men, then the theory of evolution would be certified as truth and real. Yet today, the problem is not the missing link. Rather, the whole chain's gone missing, don't you think? No chain can be found whatsoever. 
Charles Darwin tried to explain the survival of the fittest, but he never could explain the arrival of the fittest. Sir Fred Hoyle, an internationally recognized astronomer and mathematician, one of Great Britain's most uh, famous scientists, said that the chance of life coming from non-life is about 10 followed by 40 zeros. Now what does that mean? Well, this is what he went on to say. There is about as much chance of life being spontaneous, spontaneously produced from non-life as there is a tornado blowing through a junkyard and building a Boeing 747. Now you may be sitting there wondering, Rick, what's this message really all about? Because some of you, some of our young people are getting ready to go back to school, some are getting ready to start college, and, and this is going to become a... Uh, a topic of discussion in classes and with professors and so that's one of the reasons just like my pastor did for me I wanted to do it for, for those who are going back to school but, but let me tell you what this message is really all about the theory of evolution was developed in an attempt to explain how the world got here by those who refused to believe in God that's why the theory was, was developed they had to find a way how to, to, to explain how this world got here if they choose not to believe in God. And they're giving it their best shot, but it does not and will not stand the test of time. Evolution is a big fat lie. Amen. And this big lie leads us to devastating conclusions if carefully thought through. Evolutionist William Provine of Cornell University honestly admits that if evolution is true, there are five inescapable questions. One, there's no evidence for God, therefore no need for God. Two, there's no life after death. Three, there's no absolute foundation for right and wrong. Four, there's no ultimate meaning to life. And five, people don't really have free will. See, the real problem with this dangerous belief is that when God loses His preeminence, man loses his significance. So I contend that evolution and creation are incompatible. You can't have one and the other. You've got to believe in one or the other. So as I close, let me make this very personal to everyone here today. Only when you understand how you got here will you ever understand why you are here. Only God as creator can provide satisfying answers to to the basic questions of human existence. For example, where did I come from? Well, if you believe in creation, you know you came from the heart and mind of an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God who has a plan for my life. Who am I? Well, I am the highest of all God's creation, put here by a God who desires to have a personal relationship with me. Why am I here? I'm here to know that God and to love that God and to serve that God and to fulfill His plan for my life. How should I live? Well, I should live according to the commandments He's given me in His Word so that I can fulfill His will for my life. What is my destiny? Well, a life of faithfulness here and an eternity spent in the presence of the one who made me for his glory awaits me if I have a personal relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. So ladies and gentlemen, we are not a chance collection of atom and molecules and, and, um, that, that, that just happen to come together by fate or by chance. We are not the result of some cosmic lottery. The God who created all things for our enjoyment and for His praise and, 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 and glory created us. That is a truth supported not only by scientific evidence, but spoken by the God who created all science and the God who cannot lie. And ladies and gentlemen, that is why I believe in the biblical account of creation. And I hope this morning you do too. Amen.